I'm uh, Glenn Whitney, representing the National Museum of Mathematics. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, the museum and its uh, executive director, Cindy Lawrence, who's uh, also with us this evening, uh, is dedicated to is uh, trying to show the marriage of um, mathematics and culture. And that's why we're particularly delighted uh, to be here uh, this evening, to have done uh, a couple of different programs uh, with the Jacob Burns Film Center. And so we wanted to thank um, Brian Ackerman of the Film Center and Charlie Steinhorn for bringing us together uh, so that we can continue our mission uh, here this evening. Um, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be about to share the stage uh, with two very distinguished gentlemen to uh, delve into some of the ideas that uh, we just saw this evening. Um, so uh, we're, we're uh, you heard a, a number of things, and so I'll save time by not repeating, um, but uh, we're very happy to have the Coolidge Professor of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics at Harvard, uh, who have formerly held positions at Carnegie Mellon, the University of Leeds, and the University of Edinburgh. He's a uh, fellow of both the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States. Please welcome Leslie Valiant. Um, and we also have with us a gentleman who uh, began his uh, distinguished career um, in the law. He has a, uh, a JD from Harvard University. Um, and he ended up uh, being a, uh, an intellectual property lawyer uh, and then a research engineer at uh, Docomo USA Laboratory. Um, and he is now a, uh, a fellow at the uh, a research scientist at uh, TJ Watson in their uh, cryptography group. Uh, please welcome Craig Gentry. So, um, of course, we can uh, evaluate a film in many different ways, uh, you know, by uh, the uh, number of dollars it grosses the box office, by the number of tears it makes us shed. Uh, but tonight, we're going to grade this film. Let's, uh, you know, uh, you, you I'm sure you've both taught and, and uh, studied. Uh, so how, how, what grade would you give it on a scientific uh, basis? How, how well does it portray the technical challenges that this team faced and the important questions and, and how they were answered? And feel free either, either of you to jump in. So, uh, overall, I liked the film. I thought it uh, treated the big themes uh, rather well. But I suspect that maybe n no single scene is w actually happened. I think there's <laughs> an enormous amount of artistic license. But ne nevertheless, I think th you know it brought out the important themes. So, on, on, so I liked it. <laughs> and Craig, uh, I, I guess a, a B. <laughs> 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 no, I mean it's a, it's a Hollywood blockbuster, not a computer science class. So there wasn't. A lot of actual computer science in there, but it, it got at some of the, uh, I guess, the joys and frustrations of uh, doing research. Um, at IBM, we don't, you know, typically run between offices <laughs> frantically uh, <laughs> after making a discovery, but you know there is excitement there, and uh, <laughs> so it's a so it, it's it's truthy. It has some truthiness. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and so this is a case in which research in general and cryptography in particular are sort of portrayed as war heroes in themselves, uh, and of course Turing himself in particular, hugely responsible for the Allied victory. Uh, but now other you know, nations that were at war had, had their own cryptography heroes. Um, Arne Berling in Sweden, uh, Marian Ryuski in Poland, and the team that broke purple in the USA. How does Turing stand out in that group? Was there something special about the approach that we saw here tonight, or the, the real approach behind what we saw tonight? <laughs> yeah, I guess I should field that one. Um, I, I guess I don't know as much uh, about the history of uh, cryptography as I should. Uh, I mean, I, I think obviously some decisions were made to sort of condense the number of people involved in, you know, in this film, uh, in particular Bletchley Park. I mean, there were you know, thousands of people at Bletchley Park, uh, not just five or six. Um, and you know, some of the characters have been conflated into you know, a single person. So um, yeah, I mean, I think the Polish in particular had done um, you know some some uh, research on the initial machines that uh, um, that Turing used more than the film uh, gave credit for, 
but I think the reason that we respect Turing so much is that he, um, um, well, he was the first theoretical computer scientist, so we like that. Um, and he, he really put uh, computer scientists on a uh, computer science on a firm foundation. He had the idea of a universal Turing machine, um, which he explained rigorously, um, as opposed to you know sort of the more um, ad hoc approaches that, that might have occurred in different places. Cool. And so, um, you, but you could make the case that World War II turned on cryptography, that it was a pivotal part of the effort. So now. Give us a sense of how the field has developed since then. If we, if we for a moment imagine something that we hope would never happen, and there was another, you know, in the future, a, a major surface war between, between major world powers, what will the role of cryptography be in that war? Will code making and breaking, you know, again be the, some of the central players in the war? Or will, by at that point, our codes be so good, it'll be completely unassailable, and so it won't even pay a, a, a role? Oh. Uh, Okay, let me uh, take that from the top. <laughs> like, that, was, that was encoded in using the silence code. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so uh, uh, obviously cryptography played a major role in World War II, but, but how has the field developed? How can we imagine that what role it might play? Would there ever, you know, uh, uh, goodness forfend, be, be another major surface war? Will cryptography again be a major player with both sides trying to break the other's codes? Or will at that point codes be so perfect and unassailable, that'll be off the table. Both sides will be absolutely able to have their own secrets that, that the other side has no hope of, of breaking. Um, well, I don't really know the answer to that, but, um, <laughs> um, but what we call modern cryptography started uh, basically in the 1970s uh, with the RSA crypto system, which is the first uh, public key crypto system. Um, so, so you, the system, the enigma that you saw, um, so both the sender and the receiver have the same key, the same rotor settings, right? So you can imagine the encryption process is kind of like, you know, you put the me uh, message inside a, a box and you lock it with a particular key and the other guy has the same sort of key. He has a copy of the same key. So in, in the 70s, uh, some guys invented public key cryptography, which allows, you know, um, uh, you know the sender to encrypt to a, a recipient uh, without having any secret knowledge. So you can create a public key and post it out on a directory somewhere and I can get your public key and I can go ahead and encrypt a message to you without knowing any secret information. So that solves uh, like a key distribution problem. So before there was the issue of how, I, I'm not sure exactly how the Nazis did it, but somehow they communicated the rotor positions uh, securely every day to, uh, 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 to all the different posts. But that's, you can see that's a security vulnerability. Uh, public key encryption gets around this by having um, only you own the key, the receiver. Um, so anyway, my point was that, um, so modern cryptography started uh, in the 1970s and since then we've constructed uh, crypto systems really based on, on mathematics, number theory. And we actually have proofs to the effect that if you can break such and such cri crypto system, well RSA is a bad example, but well, let's, uh, let's, um, let's imagine that <laughs> uh, um, so, you know, to the effect that if you can break uh, some public key encryption schemes like RSA, then we can prove that uh, you can solve some mathematical problem efficiently, much more f efficiently than we think you could actually solve it. For example, uh, multiplying two huge numbers together, uh, um, it, it, uh, the factorization problem of taking those two huge numbers uh, apart, factoring them together into the individual prime numbers, that's a problem that we think is hard. So on the one hand, we have crypto systems that are provably secure, so we're very confident in their security because it would imply, uh, if you could break them, huge mathematical breakthroughs. On the other hand, we don't know if you know the NSA, for example, has uh, found some way to factor huge numbers, in which case, uh, well, our, our proofs don't prove anything about the security of the crypto system. So uh, I can't really say who will win this, uh, win this war, but I'm behind the NSA. <laughs> NSA. <laughs> 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 if, I may, oh, uh, please. if I may comment, so obviously the availability of powerful computers has changed uh, everything, so it, it makes uh, encryption much better, but, but it also becomes a weakness because who knows what's inside your computer, so th there are many vulnerabilities in computers beyond the actual breaking the encryption, mm. so, so this future war will be fought on, on, in, on the computer security front, but on many other fronts than, uh, uh, than just uh, encryption, because these Enigma machines, it was pretty hard to to put a virus in an enigma machine, for example. So 
those people didn't have to worry about some things. All right. So they'll, we'll be looking for the Heil Hitlers of the future um, systems for, for communicating and, and waging electronic war. In other words, the, the, the weaknesses that aren't necessarily part of the original system per se. Right, just because systems are much more complicated, they've got more, more weaknesses. Uh -huh. um, so turning now to some other aspects of, of the science in the film, the title of the film, The Imitation Game, um, does that, does that, is that a, uh, a phrase that came from Turing's work? Is that how does that relate to the science that we saw in the film? Well, um, so now you're talking to a different aspect of Turing's book, Absolutely. which is artificial intelligence. Um, so the imitation game, I'm not sure who thought that about it. I don't think it's Turing's uh, phrase. Um, it's a section heading, okay, okay. In, in, um, so in his famous paper on the Turing test, um, so he was trying to understand what it means for, uh, for a machine to be intelligent or, or for a uh, machine to think. So I, he was clearly tr partly trying to provoke uh, psychologists and philosophers into this argument because he had a very, very firm belief that uh, machines could do more than most people, people thought. Um, so I think the, um, the main point of, uh, of the Turing, t uh, the high level point is that you have to judge uh, things by its behavior. So if it uh, walks like a duck and talks like a duck, then it is a duck. That's the high level uh, description. But then Turing made some very good choices which were surprising. So, um, so to, to tell whether a uh, machine is intelligent, um, his test wasn't about playing chess or knowing chemistry. It, wa it was about kind of common sense knowledge. It's about recognizing whether you can tell whether at the other end of a wire it's a man or a woman, or a, or a man or a, or a person or a machine. He discussed both cases. Um, so the idea is that um, what's, hu what's unique to human thinking is processing everyday common garden information which isn't uh, well formalized and, and, and studied. Um, so, so that's one, one of the main aspects of the, of the Turing test. And the other, the other is that you have to measure something. You have to measure performance. You know, how often would you com confuse a, a machine which, which uh, tries to pretend to be human with a, hu uh, with a human? Um, so at a high level, it's a very powerful uh, description of what um, you, sh you should discuss when you talk about machines being intelligent. And do you think that there's any connection between these two thrusts of, of Turing's work? Is somehow the imitation game applicable in cryptography? Is, it, is that a, a way of thinking that helps you either create or, or break codes? Um, I'm not sure so directly. I mean, there is an example of uh, a Turing test that you see all the time, which is called a CAPTCHA. Like, you know, if you're trying to create a new Yahoo account, you know, sometimes it'll show some numbers and letters uh, that, you know, even humans have trouble reading, but computers have <laughs> maybe even more uh, trouble reading, although they're getting better all the time. So that's kind of an example of a Turing test that's used uh, for security purposes. Um, we don't really build, uh, I mean, I guess you can build, you can build crypto systems where the key is, is, is in some sense a biometric or in the sense that maybe it, uh, maybe the key could depend in some way on your, uh, the mini min you know, the particular way that you manipulate your mouse or uh, your keystroke uh, patterns or something like that. Um, also in cryptography, we have this notion of a, a zero-knowledge proof, which is, is kind of similar. Uh, in, in crypto, it's possible. Uh, so suppose I know a proof of, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, of, of uh, the Riemann hypothesis. It's a really uh, difficult to think, thing to prove, and I claim that I have a proof, but I don't want to reveal it to you because I don't, you know, I don't yeah. trust you. You with don't it. like you me. You might, yeah, you might, you know, take it as your own. So I just want to prove to you, know, prove to you that I know a proof without giving you the proof. And there's something called a, a zero-knowledge proof system uh, where basically by interacting with each other, having a conversation, um, uh, you, know, you, you present challenges to me and I present responses. And at the end of this conversation, you'll be satisfied that yes, indeed, uh, I do know a proof of the Riemann hypothesis but you won't actually learn anything from this proof. You won't l learn how to construct the proof yourself. You'll just be convinced that I know how to do it. And the reason is because um, the how we prove these things as cryptographers is that we say, well, this conversation just generated a, a transcript according to some, uh, some distribution you know, of challenges and responses. And it turns out that uh, even, you know, even without knowing anything about the underlying secret, about the proof of the Riemann hypothesis, 
I can generate a transcript according to the same distribution where I've, you know, kind of, I've kind of jerry-rigged the challenges for myself. But I still, I can generate this transcript according to the same distribution. And because of that fact, because I can generate a transcript with this same distribution without having any knowledge, any secret knowledge of the proof of the Riemann hypothesis, that proves that the same conversation, in some sense, that was has the same distribution, doesn't leak, doesn't reveal, doesn't contain any knowledge about the underlying proof. So th there's the same kind of uh, emulation or simulation that's going on, uh, well, a similar kind of uh, huh thing that's going on in the, in the Turing test. And just as a matter of uh, trivia, I suppose that term CAPTCHA uh, for this, you know, little "I really am a human" uh, test when you fill out a web page. The T in that, in fact, uh, memorializes Turing himself. The T in CAPTCHA stands for stands for Turing. Um, so he's remembered every day when you uh, sign up for uh, a new Yahoo account. Um, so uh, so that's interesting. So it's a theme that that comes uh, through um, uh, different branches of computer science. Um, and uh, Leslie, do you think that it's possible? for computers to bridge that gap between, you know, we, we're used to them crunching data for us and producing, you know, wonderful graphs and analyses, but to this type of behavior that could pass a Turing test? Um, um, w well, uh, certainly computers can do things now which one wouldn't have dreamt of even, uh, say, 20 years ago. So you, know, you can do language translation yourself on, on the web if you're going on vacation somewhere and you want to translate your hotel booking um, in a way which you wouldn't have dreamt, uh, wouldn't have dreamt of. Um, and most of the, and also you know, uh, voice recognition and uh, things like that, much of this works with uh, machine learning. Um, so, uh, so doing things which were uh, thought to be uh, impossible even recently I is possible. Um, so wh whether uh, um, I, th I think that now you probably have to develop and uh, re refine a bit more exactly exactly what you mean by the uh, by the Turing test. Um, so pursuing it as originally defined can become a bit uh, a bit futile. So um, so so people so some people who do it are people who write uh, software for various kinds of bots who make trivial conversation with you and it's hard to tell whether they're ri uh, they're, they're ri real or not. Um, but but in the sense of uh, trying to um, have machines achieve human level performance in identified uh, tasks, like you know, you know, can you write a one paragraph essay as good as a 10 year old, and, and things like that for some human judges. Um, so, so, so I think there are plenty of, um, of actual targets for AI challenges, which, um, which are reasonable challenges, and I think you know, they're, well, one can make progress towards them. And so you say that that computers are now able to do these, some of these types of tasks in ways that weren't dreamt of uh, a decade or so ago. So what are some of the tools? How is it that we can make computers learn in new ways that, that, that we haven't seen before? Well, um, so, the, okay, there are th three things. So, so the scientifically, um, it's based on machine learning and we do have better algorithms than we did uh, 10 years ago. But it must also be said that the Availability of, of more data is, is critical in faster machines. Um, so, uh, what a machine can do with vast amounts of data is, is kind of counterintuitive. People wouldn't have guessed 20 years ago that if you just have large amounts of data, which you, you can't store in a computer now, um, then uh, you can you can do what you can with uh, with methods which you know aren't so exotic. Um, so, it's um, algorithms, data, fast machines. And um, being probably approximately correct, I suppose, plays, uh, plays a role as well. What, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure those words are chosen with care. What, what, do, what does probably and approximately correct, you know, mean? Well, so you're referring to the question of what, the, what does, uh, what, what, what do you expect a machine, wh when do you want to declare a machine learning algorithm to actually learn? So you want some mathematical definition of when you declare a learning algorithm to be successful. So if uh, you're referring to a, a particular definition of when you declare. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. W when you declare uh, an algorithm to be successful, so basically, it's it's quite sure of efficiency. You don't want to wait forever before it works, and you want some accuracy in the in the learning. All right. Well, 
Um, certainly the film and, and the things that you have talked about this evening, you know, really give a sense of the towering legacy that, uh, that uh, Alan Turing has left behind. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, key prizes in computer science is named after him. Um, so if Alan Turing could be here right now, if he hadn't, you know, uh, met his tragedy and, or if he could be right here at the apex of his faculties, what question would you, would you want to ask him? Would you most be keen to ask him, each of you? Well, um, so I just want to second what Craig said uh, earlier. So, uh, so Alan Turing will probably be remember remembered uh, for thousands of years, but mainly because of his uh, discovery of what it means to compute. And it's even hard to discuss what computation is now, because it's so everyday uh, that it's hard to describe it as a, as a great scientific feat. But, but that's the reason why, why we're talking about him. And certainly his extraordinary uh, role in the Second World War and his contributions to to AI and everything else, they're also extraordinary. But the reason why you know um, t uh, why we're discussing him is because of his extra extraordinary contribution to the founding of uh, understanding of comp computation. Um, so, um, so what he was, what a good scientist is good at is asking questions. Uh -huh. So I think what everyone would want to ask Turing is, you know, what's he work, what what's what's he working on now? What's what's, what's <laughs> a great question now? <laughs> Craig, anything to add? Um, yeah, I guess I would ask him what he thinks thinking is. Um, so I, I think that we would agree with him that uh, to the extent that people think um, it's possible in principle to uh, make computers eventually uh, that think in that way. Um, you know, I don't want to touch, you know, about issues of the soul and so forth, but, you know, I, I, as a computer scientist, I have to, I don't see any fundamental obstacles to uh, constructing a human brain eventually. Um, so, but uh, the harder question is what, what exactly is, what, I what exactly are we aiming for? What is uh, thought? I mean, that's what we want to achieve ultimately in AI as a sort of a nebulous goal. Um, I mean, you can, you can create rigorous definitions and probabilistically approximately correct is, is a good uh, rigorous definition of learning, but we have this, uh, nebulous uh, philosophical feeling about what uh, thought is. And uh, yeah, so I would ask him what, what he thinks th uh, thought is. All right, excellent. Well, uh, some big issues then uh, that the film and, and our discussions raised. And so I'm sure some of you uh, may be curious about things yourself. So we have uh, at least one person around up. Oh, there's a question right here. Oh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, professor, um <coughs> uh, the question of AI is obviously a fascinating question. We've seen a lot in movies and so forth. Um, a related question, without getting into the definition of what does it mean to think, what does the word think mean? Do computers think? Will they think? A related question is, is which you sometimes see in the movies, is will. You know, a computer having a will to do something. So forget about whether Watson can beat the Jeopardy champions or Deep Blue can be the world chess champion. Deep Blue doesn't care whether it plays chess or doesn't play chess or whether it wins or loses. But a computer with a will is a thing that is either the utopia or dystopia that you, you, know, you read about and so forth. And I guess the question is, do you see any anywhere on the horizon progress towards something like that, not just a more advanced calculator, but something that actually desires to do things? I think that's a uh, really very philosophical, philosophical question. So as, as human, as a human, you can rec recognize other humans when they want to do something and when they don't. Uh, when you look at a machine, you say, you don't see anything like that. But I mean, what if you look at a, a termite or a mouse? Uh, you know, do you recognize any will, will there? So, um, so I'm not quite sure whether uh, this will is, uh, is a, is a well-defined notion. It may be just something that in other, humans, we understand each other kind of internally because we're very similar and we sympathize with uh, whatever the minds are, are doing. Um, so it's not clear to me that it's, uh, uh, you can apply this question to, to, to machines. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Um, the film was very inspiring and we, we know about Alan Turing's role in um, saving the Western world. Uh, today, it seems as if we're using algorithms for things like finding out whether women are pregnant so that Target can market to them. Um, so I'm wondering, 
um, forgive me, it's not asking so much about the mathematics, but the purpose of it. Are we working, are we using some of these mathematics and cryptography for purposes such as reducing poverty or, or uh, addressing questions of hunger or war reduction, uh, war and peace, you know, the fostering peace negotiations, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, I guess that one goes to me. Um, um, well, I, I think, uh, I mean, you have seen examples of where cryptography has been used, uh, for example, in uh, revolutions. Again, this is not really my area of expertise, but I mean, I have noticed, uh, for example, in the, you know, the Green Revolution in Iran, uh, there was um, essentially, uh, what was it? I don't know. Does this some way there was some way in which I, I don't know if they use Tor, like you know, some some uh, ano anonymization network. Or they, they use uh, I don't remember the details, but they they have been used uh, to organize uh, revolutions and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's also being uh, so like in healthcare, for example, you want to um, encrypt uh, sensitive data about uh, you know any genetic predispositions you might have. Uh, that insurers might be interested in so that they don't insure you. Um, uh, so you want to ensure that that information is carefully controlled. Um, I mean, I again, not my area, I mean, you know, I don't know all the details, but uh, I, the healthcare industry is regulated in such a way that the, I, I believe that they're, you know, uh, required to encrypt the data so that, uh, you know, if someone, um, you know, gets access to a server, you know, they don't just get all the, uh, clear text uh, information about the page patients and uh, oh sorry. Uh, well no in particular um, uh, I uh, worked for a while on a project that um, was doing research on uh, the genetics of autism mm -hmm. um, which is uh, of course another theme uh, that we don't have time to go into this evening uh, in, in the movie set tonight um, and their uh, medical data about individuals uh, had to be shared from multiple institutions um, in order to, you know, to get the results that the study was looking for. But of course, each one of these institutions is bound by privacy laws to not reveal the identities of its patients, and yet we somehow have to combine the records of the same patient from, from different institutions without compromising their identities. Uh, and it strikes me now that some, like your work with, uh, you know, being able to compute on um, information without revealing that information would now make this as an essentially a trivial problem. Uh, yeah, I'm working on something called homomorphic encryption, which is uh, kind of a mouthful. Uh, but uh, what it means is that um, uh, if you have uh, a bunch of data that happens to all be uh, encrypted, um, what uh, le let's say that um, you know you want to use the cloud, right? You want to use uh, Amazon Cloud or IBM Cloud, uh, whatever. Uh, and so you want to put your data out on the cloud, but you want to encrypt it because you don't, you know, you don't completely trust uh, IBM or Amazon with uh, with all of your information. Uh, on the other hand, you want to get the benefit of the cloud, which is that the cloud processes uh, your data for, for you instead of just you know sending it all to you when you when uh, when you ask for it. You know, it, you might want the cloud to do some intelligent processing on your encrypted data for you while it's encrypted without the secret key. And uh, what homomorphic encryption allows you to do is, is exactly that. It, you can have the, c the cloud manipulate the, uh, your encrypted data according to some function that you tell it to prescribe. And it can compute that function on your encrypted data and get a, a cipher text that represents the result and send that to you and you can, you can decrypt that. So that's a way that uh, you can make your personal privacy Compatible with our desire to, you know, to use the cloud and take advantage of all of these services. Okay, another question. I think, yeah, right there. Um, some years ago, I worked with a group that was trying to do um, develop what we called expert systems. Um, we interviewed people who were expert designers in very complicated semiconductor <laughs> designs and tried to encode that in a way that we could write a design manual and give it to someone else who was had some minimal knowledge of design, but then they could start to execute these designs themselves. And we found it almost impossible to do. 
has AI made any progress in things like expert systems that make it more possible that we can capture human expertise in technical things and give it to someone else in a manual that really works? <laughs> we need a better microphone manual. That's okay. Um, so the uh, expert system paradigm, where you try to ex extract from a human uh, their knowledge uh, to, to try to replicate it by machine, I think that hasn't uh, found out. So, for example, in, in chess, uh, the best chess playing programs don't, uh, you know don't interview chess champions and see how things are done, but do some, you know, uh, some large-scale search. So, uh, so I think most of the success stories are, n are not by examining how humans solve problems, but by some other means. So you're saying, in essence, it's easier to digest information than to extract already digested information from the way our brains have organized it? W well, I think we're probably just not very articulate. <laughs> that uh, that if, if you ask a doctor how uh, he or she makes diagnoses, uh, maybe they're not articulate enough to tell you. Whereas if you take uh, data from uh, 100,000 patients and uh, right. see everything, then there's much more information there than a doctor can tell you. Okay, I guess, yeah, we have one in the middle. Uh, yeah, um, one of the uh, enigmas of uh, the, the Turing test is the fact that um, it with automatic uh, question answering systems, the, the better and the more accurate they become, the worse they become at the, at the Turing test because human beings make mistakes. They are awkward in their answers. They, um, they, s they stammer, they think um, or, or pause between answers, things like this, and so the best machines to pass the Turing test are ones that do exactly that, that re replicate these idiosyncrasies of, of human beings. So with that, the question then becomes, what or is it that we really want computers to be able to do? Um, do? Do we want them to become more like humans, or do they, we want them to become something that we're not? I guess that's the question. <laughs> well, well, okay, so what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> Well, what I was suggesting is that if you choose tasks which you find are, va are valuable, which humans can do, and get machines to do it as well or better, then I think that's uh, valuable. I mean, the issue of whether d just simulating humans for its own sake is good or not, actually something which uh, Turing touched on in one of his papers and very, very eloquently, eloquently. And he said that you know, just trying to make machines to look like people or s seem human is... Uh, almost in bad taste, a bit like uh, artificial flowers. Um, <laughs> except that um, trying to replicate human thought is, is an exception because by trying to replicate human thought, we'll find out something more about ourselves. So I think, uh, I think he put it as well as anyone has since. Yes, hi. Um, artificial language, or no, artificial intelligence, how much is natural language a part of AI? Do the computers uh, are they really going to start talking like people? You talked about pausing and maybe hiccuping or w whatever to make it appear like it's normal, hesitating. But for example, for people who lack sight, to be able to speak to a computer and have it print out what it's saying, is that part of the natural language or, or AI, any of what you're talking about? Um. Well, no, I think people are interested in, in having hu human-like responses, having, say, robots uh, w which help uh, old people. Um, there are various criteria. That what kind of robots do you find pleasant to have around in your home, for example, or some kind of human-like behavior? So th there's a lot of work on that. Um, yes, I think it's, it's important. Yes, uh, do you think Alan Turing is ever going to get credit for the uh, Turing automobile? No, um, no, really. The um, I'm I'm thinking about all the, r the reporting that's been done um, on the Sony break-in, 
And a lot of the experts have said things like, it's not um, if your corporation is going to be broken into, it's when. Um, are we heading towards uh, an area where just encryption is just going to be breakable close to 100% of the time? Or <coughs> are there things like, um, I have my phone here, I get into it by touching it with my finger. Um, I imagine getting into my phone by licking it and having a DNA test done and that, you know, that's, that might be fairly uh, complicated encryption a few years from now. Are we heading towards your, our computers are safe or going to be safe? And maybe in particular, do, do what kind of en encryption do you use on your computers to keep them safe? Um. I don't have any secrets, so I, I don't worry about it. Uh. <laughs> no, um, no, I, I'm not really a good user of cryptography. <laughs> I'm mainly a producer. So, um, no, if 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 the apocalypse happens, I, I would vote against it happening because uh, the crypto is broken. I, I, f I feel like the crypto is probably the the strongest link. Uh, the Sony attacks, is, as I understand them, the. Uh, I haven't seen so many details, but uh, it um, it wasn't because the crypto was bad that uh, all of this information w was leaked. It was because it was all just you know stored in the, in the clear, and what whatever was password protected. Well, there was a password file over here in the clear, and you know it, that contains all the passwords, and you know uh, implementation issues. The other vulnerabilities. L loose lips <laughs> sink ships. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so. Um, I'll say it's a, at least it's not uh, you know going to come from the crypto. I, I can't say I'm. Um, I would be that surprised if there was some sort of uh, you know cyber apocalypse uh, on the horizon, but uh, at least it won't be because of the crypto. So artificially <laughs> intelligent uh, information protectors might do a better job than than us poor humans at uh, keeping our, our own secrets. That would actually be a, a good use of artificial intelligence. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> With respect to artificial intelligence, I'm just curious if you know, in developing, um, you know, sort of the next generation of um, computers, the notion that um, neuropsychologists are looking at elasticity of the brain, it, as you learn something new, your brain is actually changing and becoming um, more powerful in some ways. Um, is it possible that, um, you know, again, we're getting back to this notion that AI look like human thought or that the power to be able to change the way it would compute based on, I guess, new data that could potentially come through? And is it possible that machines could actually produce insight? In other words, you know, we think we're the ones that are going to come up with the cure for cancer. Well, of course, we look at the data, you know, the data is run by machines, et cetera. Is it possible that a machine could come up with the cure for cancer through an insight um, compute? I, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. I'm not a computer scientist. But I'm just wondering, is, it, is, is that sort of application possible with a computer? Um, yes, I mean, I think much of, as you say, much of scientific research is done with computers. Computers are searching for possible hypotheses. Whether well, at the end of the day you call that discovery as insight is, uh, is, a, is a question of interpretation. But um, uh, certainly the idea that computers expand our brains in all directions, including doing science, I, th I think that's, that's clearly here, here, or here already. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, switch back to uh, Enigma and encryption machines and the idea. Are you familiar with the Hedy Lamar invention? The what? Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar yeah. invented oh, uh, yeah. with with her colleague George Anthel a uh, call it uh, a way to do s what's now called spread spectrum technology. Now, is that really an, an original invention from them, or was it preceded by work that the Polish had done? Nothing's totally independent. Hetty uh, and George were just inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and some of you know that Richard Rhodes wrote a book called Hetty's Folly. And their uh, encryption method was for a submarine to communicate with its torpedo and keep changing the frequency 
so that uh, it wasn't, couldn't be jammed. And they did this by a, a concept based on player piano rolls, both in the torpedo and in the uh, submarine. It was patented and then filed away secretly by the U.S. Navy, but now it's sort of surfaced and she's famous for cryptography, uh, 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 for this type of uh, spe spectrum technology. Is that in some way, uh, how should I, how does it relate to Enigma and your type of cryptography? Uh, well, the relationship to my type of cryptography is not very strong. Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of similar to the Igni Igni Enigma machine in the sense that you could, uh, I guess, imagine the, spe you know, the spectrum is a, a kind of analogous to the different rotor settings. Uh, so, I mean, it is a kind of, uh, I guess, a kind of secret key uh, cryptography in a sense. But yeah, I don't know exactly how they, uh, how, how it works. So how exactly they agree on, on w which frequencies they meet at. There must be, uh, I, I guess, some way uh, where they coordinate that agreement. Yeah, yeah. So, so in some sense, it's like the rotors that are just, um, you know, clicking in the same order given the same initial settings. Um, yeah. So, as I said, um, and the crypto we do today is uh, is very kind of number theoretic. It's it's really more of a mathematical discipline than, uh, um, you know, any particular crazy machine or uh, um, that sort of thing. A player piano type of machine. Um, it's all you know, it's all formulas. <laughs> All right, well, I hope uh, this evening has been as thought-provoking for you as it has been for me, and please let's thank our uh, panelists one more time. Craig, Leslie, thank you so much.